Jacob Burton here from StellaCulinary.com. And in our previous three videos on brining, we discussed how a brine actually works through diffusion and not osmosis, how and why brines will allow meat to retain more moisture during the cooking process, the three major approaches to brining, and then how to calculate a salt percentage for both the gradient and equilibrium style of brines. Now, in this, our final video on the science behind brining, we're going to discuss secondary ingredients that can be used to enhance a brine, how to speed up the brining process, and then how long you should actually brine a given product. Now, once you construct your brine, whether using the gradient or equilibrium method, any number of secondary ingredients can be added to improve the brine's overall effect on flavor, texture, and even moisture retention. Now, these secondary ingredients are best understood when broken into their four individual categories, which I like to label as sweeteners, acids and bases, herbs and spices, and other forms of salt. First, let's talk about the sweeteners. Now, the purpose of adding any sweetness to your brine is to mask or balance the saltiness while enhancing the brine's overall flavor. Although anything that adds sweetness to a brine can be used, the most common ingredients are sugar, both white and brown, honey, corn syrup, cola, as in, you know, Coca-Cola, and molasses. Now, these sweeteners are usually added in a concentration of 1% to 5% based upon the water's weight. Now, it's important to note that commonly just enough sugar or sweetener is added to balance the salt, but not enough to actually leave a perceptible sweetness when the brine product is consumed. Now, there are some exceptions to this rule, like any cooking rule, but that's pretty much what you're going for. Now, the purpose of using acids and bases is both to enhance overall flavor and to actually change the protein's texture. Now, common ingredients used for this purpose are vinegar, wine, citrus, uh, citrus juice, citric acid, uh, baking soda, lye, and soda lime. Now, instead of a precise percentage... Just enough acid or base ingredients is added to the brine to drop the pH of the solution uh, below 4.8 or to raise it above 8.5. Now, the acidic or base environments will actually start to break down uh, some of the protein's connective tissue and unravel the protein strands themselves, making the finished product more tender. Now, when enough acid or base is added to a brine so that it affects the protein's texture, mainly its tenderness, you're getting really close to the territory of a marinade. And really, the the line but between a marinade and a brine is very, very hazy. And we're going to talk uh, more in depth about marinades in a future video series. Now, herbs and spices, on the other hand, are used specifically to add a secondary complementary flavor to brines. Now, this could really be any number of ingredients, but some common ones just kind of uh, to throw out there uh, include thyme, cloves, cinnamon, peppercorns, bay leaf, and mace. But again, this can be any sort of uh, herb or spice that you like. You can also use aromatics like uh, you know onions and carrots and celery as well. Now, the actual use percentage uh, is really dependent upon your desired flavor profile and the pungency of the urban spice. Uh, so you're going to use them about a half percent on the low side to you know, 5% on, uh, by weight on the high side. So something like rosemary that's really, really uh, has a strong flavor, you're not really going to want to use more than half a percent of rosemary in your brine, especially if it's really fresh, because it can totally permeate and take over the overall flavor of your brine. Now, when using herbs and spices in a brine, the best way to incorporate their flavor is to first uh, bring the water to a simmer and simmer or steep the herbs and spices like you're making a tea or a stock. And once the flavor is to your liking, pass the water through a strainer, uh, add some salt, and chill to below room temperature for, uh, before using it. Now, this is going to accomplish two things. Number one, on fresh herbs and any sort of a food product, there could be a little bit of bacteria that could uh, spoil your brine. But because of the salt content, that's usually not a big deal. But popping uh, these ingredients into simmering water is going to basically pasteurize them, uh, and it won't spoil your brine. But number two, the exterior flesh of um, meat, both fish and land animals, basically works as a very fine 
uh, sieve or very fine a strainer for these aromatics that are contained within uh, your, your herbs and your spices. So if you dissolve them into the water first and you taste the water and it's to your liking and then strain it out, you're going to get much more consistent results than if you place the herbs and spices into the brine and allow them to continue to diffuse into that brining liquid while you're brining your protein. Sometimes they'll come out uh, a little more uh, strongly flavored than you would like. Now, the final category of secondary ingredients for brines is other forms of salt. Now, while most brine recipes call for sodium chloride, which is you know common table salt, other salts with more negatively charged ions can be used to aid in moisture retention while minimizing the f- uh, familiar salty flavor of sodium chloride. Now, besides sodium chloride, there are three salts that I would really kind of uh, urge you to pay attention to and consider adding to your brine to help aid moisture retention. And these salts are calcium chloride and then two types of phosphate salt, uh, sodium tripolyphosphate and sodium hexmetaphosphate. Now, both the phosphate salts and the calcium chloride have more negatively charged ions than sodium chloride, which will increase water retention during the brining process. Now, this is something that we discussed in depth uh, in the uh, second video of our brining series. So if you're unfamiliar with how negatively charged ions actually allow proteins to uptake more moisture during the brining process, uh, I would suggest that you go back and review that video or watch it for the first time if you haven't seen it yet. Now, anyone who has ever used calcium chloride in ionic spherification, which is a modern technique used to make the pho caviar, like the melon caviars, you know that it's, uh, you know has a bitter taste, bitter aftertaste. However, when you use it in a small percentage, uh, usually below a threshold of 0.03%, so you use 0.03% by weight, its bitter flavor is imperceptible in such a small dosage, but it will still add enough negatively charged ions uh, to the brine to positively affect moisture retention. Now, sodium tripolyphosphate and sodium hexametaphosphate are usually used in concentrations as low as 0.02% on the very low end to 0.3% by weight. Again, all of this is going to be calculated based upon the water's weight. Now, these salts don't dissolve as easily as other forms of salt, so they must first be dissolved in a small amount of warm, not hot water, because hot water will deactivate them, but a little bit of warm water is going to help dissolve them, and then you can take them in their dissolved state and add them to your brining formula. Now, once your brine is formulated, uh, it does take some time for the salt and other ingredients to diffuse into the product that you're brining, but there is, however, a few different methods you can use to speed up the brining process. The first is a jacquard, also commonly referred to as a needler, which tenderizes meat by shortening the muscle fibers, but also allows for brines and marinades to diffuse more quickly throughout the protein. Now, the second is a simple brine or uh, marinade injector, which allows liquids to be injected directly into the interior of the protein's flesh, uh, speeding up diffusion. Now, the third, which is normally reserved uh, for commercial use, is a vacuum tumbler, which is a very cool thing, because it actually tumbles proteins and liquids, such as brines and marinades, together under vacuum. Now, the combination of low atmospheric pressure caused by the vacuum and the tumbling process can reduce brine durations from hours and days to mere minutes. Now, before we wrap this up, I want to mention this chart I made that uh, will be available for you to look over at stellaculinary.com slash brine. Now, this chart assumes the use of a 5% brine, and please note that the times given here are approximations. Now, since I use almost exclusively a 5% brine in most of my recipes and videos, uh, you can refer to a specific recipe for more information on the brine duration and its accompanying procedure. But basically, this chart uh, will give you some good ballpark figures uh, when it comes time for you to play around with creating your own brines. Now, the reason why I'm using a 5% brine, and we're not talking about uh, time charts for equilibrium brining, is because as we discussed in our previous video, With equilibrium brining, as soon as your salt meter reaches the desired salinity level that you want in your finished protein, then your brine is done. So your 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 protein or your brine duration is based more upon the readings from your salt meter than actual a given time.
Now, since this chart will be available in the show notes, there's really no reason for me to go over it word for word here, but there are a few important things that I want to briefly bring to your attention. Now, first, the brine time is how long the protein should sit in the brine, and the rest time is how long the item should be allowed to rest out of the brine uh, after being rinsed. So, for example, when brining a chicken breast in a 5% brine, I recommend that you brine it for four to six hours, remove the breast from the brine, rinse it thoroughly, and then let rest for two to four hours in your refrigerator before cooking. Also, when brining the pork loin, pork chop, or pork tenderloin, you can substitute 100% of the water with cola, which is a pretty classic approach to brining pork. However, it's very important to note that you should never mix curing salt, sodium nitrate, or nitrite, with cola because it will form a potentially lethal compound. So use regular table salt or regular sodium chloride only. Other than that, this chart is meant to be a jumping off point for you to create your own brine recipes, uh, but please as always use your best judgment and feel free to tweak as necessary. Now, one more helpful guideline to keep in mind uh, is that the time required for brining a given protein will scale approximately with the square of the protein's thickness. So that means a piece of meat that is twice as thick will take roughly four times as long to brine. So that'll kind of give you a good idea when you're scaling uh, brine recipes up and down for various thicknesses of meats. Now, we did cover a ton of information in our brining video series, so you can keep track of all this stuff at our singular resource found at stellaculinary.com slash brining, and there you can take a quiz, you can download this PDF, ask questions, and get more information. And as always, if you haven't yet subscribed to us through iTunes or YouTube, uh, you can do that by going to your favorite source and subscribing, and that way you won't miss any of our new videos which we release on a weekly basis.